rapper gives his all to achieve his dream. He had already accomplished a whole lot, performing and opening up for, you know, ludicrous. I make more money in a month week than a month make all his life. But the music stops and shots ring out. She's hard to understand. She is screaming. He's dead on the floor with gunshot wounds. That's when I was like, this can't be real. The gruesome crime scene challenges investigators to question every detail before them. It was a dangerous crowd that he ran with. We don't have enough evidence at this point to tell the story. Let's keep going. You never know what's going to turn up and help us out. Then when the curtain finally closes on this investigation, a calculated killer will step into the spotlight. I told them that they need to find a cell phone. If he was doing anything, it was recorded on that cell phone. I kept thinking, this is a movie, but it was real. It was horrific. It, it was horrible. Look at this night. Y'all see this Right. Y'all see how this This is manipulative behavior of a murderer. So, how did I've seen a lot of evil in my career, but I've never seen evil document itself like that. I said, bro, you dancing with the devil. December 29th, 2007. It's 10.50 p.m. in Clayton County, Georgia, as a call breaks the silence of the 911 dispatch center. There was a 911 call that was placed by a neighbor. Sierra Harp had knocked on uh, her neighbor's door uh, kind of frantically. She was holding her three-year-old daughter, Angel. The neighbor can tell, number one, that she's been stabbed multiple times. Number two, that she's been stabbed seriously. police arrive, they quickly encounter the victim, 28-year-old Sierra Harp. She was hysterical. No one could understand what she was saying, and she was bleeding heavily. Her neighbor, who called 911, tells police that Sierra lives in the nearby apartment with her child's father, Raheem Grant. The neighbor had kind of gotten a little bit of information about that there had been a domestic, but she had no idea that Raheem was going to come after Sierra in some way, shape, or form. Officers cautiously make their way to Sierra's apartment to find Raheem. They were able to um, walk through the front door. They made a turn to the left, and that's where they were first confronted with Raheem's body. Most of the bottom of his body was in the bathroom, and then the top portion of his body was laying face down in the bedroom. Officers were able to observe at least three bullet wounds, two in his back and one in Police realized pretty quickly that, that he was not alive when they got there. With an apparent homicide and an injured victim on their hands, first responders quickly called detectives to the scene. In the bathroom bedroom area, they see that the mirror had been pierced by a bullet. Uh, there were perforations in the wall. There was a lot of blood on the wall. They found seven shell casings. They found a few around his body, and then one was actually on the bed. Detectives find a driver's license and are able to confirm that the deceased is Raheem Grant. The key piece of evidence in, in the investigation is victimology. It's what brought the victim into this circumstance, trying to learn, you know, is there some type of history for all the parties that we have involved? Who are the people that were in this location? The victim always has something to say, even after they're in the grave. Born in Fayetteville, Georgia on March 30th, 1989, Raheem Grant seemed destined for the spotlight. Raheem was one of a kind. He's been into entertainment ever since he was like three and a half years old. He um, started doing the drums and then he went from there on the microphone. He was on Showtime at the Apollo age seven. He wanted to be the educational rapper. We went into all type of schools, all type of um, events that was helping to teach to think first before you act. Excuse me, Mr. 
the moon and B. But the topic for today is B to the E, the S to the T. Be the best that you can be. Then he became a teenager and he was like, you know what, I think I want to change from being the educational rapper to being a gangster rapper. But he didn't want to just rap. He wanted to also do the part that he thought made the money, which was engineering and being able to produce. He was almost a savant, if you will, as far as in the music industry, as far as how he knew the theory of it and how to mix music. Raheem was well on his way to establishing his rap career under the name Red Beezy. He had already accomplished a whole lot, you know, performing and opening up for, you know, Ludacris, opening up for um, big artists as well as, you know, when we did the concert at Tuskegee, Master P and everybody, Goody Mob, all of them, they knew him. In 2013, the up-and-coming musician had a fateful encounter with a fan named Sierra Harp. She went up like she wanted an autograph. She was like, Red Beezy, not only thank you for the autograph, but listen, can I um, ask you for a job? And he was like, what you do? And she was like, well, we, we do like promotion in the clubs. And she said, I would like to help promote your next event. Sierra thought this was a pathway to the future. He was like, well, okay, I'll give you, um, I'll give you a shot. And that's how it got started with her with him. But two months later, Raheem's working relationship with Sierra took a turn. She told me she was pregnant. And I said, oh, you are? Do you know the, the baby father? And she was like, yeah, Raheem is my baby father. And I looked at her, I was like, what? On November 20th, 2014, Raheem and Sierra welcomed a baby girl named Angel Grant. He loved his daughter, and when he got this daughter, he became the great his dad, and he changed, his whole world changed. It starts to mature him a little bit. He has a baby girl, and he wants the best for her. Though he loved being a father, Raheem wasn't ready to settle down and start a family. He said that Sierra, her mom, she's the only the baby mom. Sierra didn't think they were in a traditional monogamous relationship, and I believe that she was okay with that. When a child is born out of wedlock, I meaning the parents aren't married, and the child has not been legitimated by the father, the state does not recognize him to be the father of that child. He literally had zero rights to his child. So he was basically at the mercy of Sierra to be able to see his daughter. Even without legal custody of his daughter, Raheem stepped up and did everything he could to smoothly co-parent with Sierra. Sierra was living with Mr. Grant. His status was not in a relationship at that time. The understanding was that they were going to co-parent and he allowed her to live there. I saw Raheem on a regular basis with his daughter out in the community. They'd be riding on her little, her little tripe. He had one eye on his career, getting as high as he could, as popular as he could in the rap game. But he had another eye on her. He wanted to make sure that whatever she needed, he was going to provide for her. And that's why he was so energized and so ambitious about his career. By December 2017, Raheem was ready to embark on his first national tour. This tour was going to be city to city to city. We was going to be going for a year. I was excited for him and um, and nervous at the same time because I know a lot of times there'd be so much people hating each other. Raheem wanted this gang personality and that's a dangerous crowd that he ran with. He chose that persona. He chose that way of life. He would always tell me, Mom, um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to live to get 25. He would always tell me that. And I'm like, will you stop saying that? And he would be like, seriously, I'm for real. Now, as detectives stand over the body of 28-year-old Raheem Grant, it seems his premonition has come true. Police arrived to Raheem's apartment and found him dead. Detectives immediately begin processing the scene. 
the neighbor had suspected that there had been a domestic incident between the two of them. Now they find Rahim dead. While investigators secure the scene, another theory of how Rahim may have died begins circulating through the neighborhood. There were some allegations that uh, Rahim was involved in gangs and he was selling drugs and that maybe somebody came in and shot him. You never want to assume anything about a victim or a defendant. Just because someone has a persona, looks a certain way, has certain tattoos, is affiliated with any other people, you never assume anything about them. Police were befuddled. They were trying to figure it all out. And at that point, Sierra wasn't helping. She was fighting with the medical techs. She was combative. She did not want to be dealt with. She was intoxicated. Her blood alcohol content is approximately three times the legal limit. She was drunk. Sierra is also severely injured. Sierra has been stabbed in her legs multiple times. The largest stab wounds was right above one of her tattoos. There was blood just pouring from her leg. Because she was wounded, uh, paramedics had to take her to the hospital. She's whisked away to surgery because they're concerned that she may lose too much blood and lose her life. Her daughter was taken in. Unable to speak with either Rahim or Sierra, Investigators are left with more questions than answers. We kind of started putting the pieces together from friends at the apartment. It was difficult to see the truth about what happened. Coming up, the crime scene tells a troubling story. There were shell casings. There was a lot of blood on the wall. They told me he was the aggressor and she was the victim. She wasn't going to stand up for her son if he had done the things that she alleged. She wanted to know the truth. Detectives in Clayton County, Georgia, are investigating the death of 28-year-old rapper Raheem Grant. Aside from Sierra Harp, the only potential eyewitness is Rahim and Sierra's three-year-old daughter. Police officers, unless we're specifically trained, we don't interview children under a certain age because children are easily led. I could ask a question and I could definitely get an answer I want from a child more so than an adult. Police execute search warrants on both Rahim's apartment and the apartment of his neighbor who called 911, where they make an important discovery. That's where police found the gun that was used, the 380, to kill Rahim. She said Sierra actually had the gun in her hand in the neighbor's apartment. It is my understanding that the gun is registered to another family member of Rahim's. And the neighbor believed that there had been some sort of horrifying domestic where both people got injured and one died. Authorities collect the weapon as evidence along with a cell phone left behind. It'll go in a bag, it'll go in a secure evidence room locker, and it'll be at some point later in the investigation that they'll obtain a search warrant to try to get into that phone if every other avenue of investigation fails. After bagging the phone, investigators turn their attention to the victim. Police are trying to figure out exactly what happened, and they look over and they notice a knife. It is a serrated knife that is a couple inches long, and it has a handle that's kind of in the shape of a short T that you can put between your fingers right here so you can kind of punch and stab someone at the same time. From the story Sierra had told her neighbor about a domestic assault between Sierra and Rahim. Our photographer went to the hospital to take photographs of Sierra's injuries. These were bad wounds. They were not superficial. It looks like an open and shut case of self-defense. They see that Sierra has stab wounds and they see Rahim dead on the floor with gun wounds they were working under the assumption very quickly that this was a self-defense type of homicide 
Authorities reach out to Rahim's friends and family to get a better idea of his background. I was like, you know, this can't be real. What's happening? Who shot him? Why is he dead? I couldn't believe it. It was like I was in another world, out of body experience, where you didn't know how to think and why are they playing this joke on me. And I asked who was the person that had killed my son. They told me they thought it was Sierra. They told me he was the aggressor and she was the victim. According to Geraldine Grant, her son had a troubled relationship with Sierra Harp. Geraldine told me that Sierra was obsessed with Raheem's success. Sierra was looking to rock Raheem's coattails as he was becoming a, a more and more sought after performer. Raheem didn't want her to ride his coattails or didn't want any woman to ride his coattails at this point. I told her the only reason that you are here is because you are the baby mom, but you are not Raheem's girlfriend. She knew that. Despite the tension between Raheem and Sierra, Geraldine says she simply cannot believe that her son had been violent. When Raheem gets angry, he really don't talk. He'll say, you know, I, I'm not even going there with you. I have never seen him hit a girl. I have never seen, that's what I've kept telling them, never. Geraldine was very clear to me, and that's why she wanted this investigation done the best that it could possibly be done because she wasn't going to stand up for her son if he had done the things that were alleged. She wanted to know the truth more than anything else in this world. But the only person who can give a statement about what happened is still unable to talk to authorities. Sierra is unconscious in the hospital. She was sedated. I don't think she spoke to police for days. On January 2nd, four days after the murder, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation shot in his upper back, his lower back, twice in one arm, twice in the other arm, and once in the head. She's a tiny girl. I wouldn't classify anything as overkill in a self-defense scenario. But one detail concerns investigators. Assuming that this was a self-defense type of homicide. It doesn't explain how he got the bullet wound at the top of his head. Was there any point in time during this occurrence that that danger was eliminated without having to take a life? You can't tell me that there wasn't a point in time where he wasn't to the point where she could have left that apartment building without having to take his life. The autopsy also reveals that Raheem suffered from superficial stab wounds. There was already injuries uh, that, that you could document before shots were fired. Rahim had cuts to his forehead, and he also had some cuts to the back of his shoulder. They appeared to be two parallel lines, two small parallel lines. And if you match that up to the autopsy photos, it was clear that that punch knife was very, very likely to be the object that caused those injuries to Rahim. Police want to know, how did he get uh, the stab wounds? Why was he stabbed? Sierra never mentioned that she was the one doing the stab. Domestic violence has become that kind of way in America where, you know, we almost assume that the male is the aggressor and the female is the victim. Rahim had been shot six days prior. At this point, police need to get Sierra's side of the story. Coming up, a new witness emerges. I remember crying out for help because the girl was still in the apartment. Suddenly, there's another person that was in the apartment that night, and that person might have seen something. And a twisted cover-up is revealed. I told them that they need to find a cell phone. He probably stabbed himself, but I didn't stab him. Though the 
The shooting death of Raheem Grant was originally believed to be an act of self-defense. New clues now suggest the case might not be so simple. He had received injuries. He had a cut on his head. He had injuries uh, to his arms and in this type of altercation. It would be consistent if he was alleging self-defense. The injuries that he had received that leaves the questions of, was it actual murder? Was it possibly manslaughter? On January 4th, six days after the shooting, investigators are finally able to speak with the woman they believe shot Rahim, the mother of his child, Sierra Harp. She was released from the hospital. She was living with her mother. At this point, she was a witness. We're working on a self-defense theory. So it was a voluntary interview. Can you tell me exactly what happened? I don't remember how anything started. I remember cooking dinner and him drinking and him taking three Xanaxes because I asked him not to. And when he doesn't take anything, he's fine, he's happy. And uh, he took it anyway, so I knew to be on guard. And um, meaning, like, not to upset him or anything like that because he was very abusive. Sierra described Rahim as um, violent, had beaten her for years. I just remember cooking, and then he told me to go along because he had to take care of some business. And I re remember seeing a girl sitting on the couch. Sierra told detectives that Rahim had a friend come over that night from the gym. Her name was Elise Jones. Police at that point became interested because suddenly there's another person that was in the apartment that night and that person might have seen something he came in and he said something and i said i can't hear what you're saying your music is too loud because he didn't want to hear he didn't want the girl to hear what he was saying and then he hit me and he slapped me and he started punching me sierra said that she had a knife um, holster down at her ankle and that's where she always kept her knife and she said during the course of the fight, the knife fell out and Rahim was able to grab it and start stabbing her. And I remember crying out for help because the girl was still in the apartment. And he kept saying, shut the F up, shut the F up. And I kept saying, he's just stabbing me, please help. And she got up off the couch and said, he's him about to go to let Sometime after Elise left, Sierra claimed that Raheem flew into a rage. She claimed that she was crying and the blood was running into her face and she was blinded at that point. Raheem had a gun on him that, according to Sierra, he carried all the time. She was able to grab the gun and she just started firing the gun. She didn't know if she had hit him, but she knew that he'd stopped coming at her. I remember turning around and I saw my daughter and I grabbed her and I just ran. And then I woke up in the hospital. During the course of her interview, she was behaving relatively normally. She seemed credible. Still, detectives press Sierra about some evidence that doesn't fit her story. There was a uh, not done. And there was stab wounds on him. But I didn't stab him. So could down on the floor when he sustained that wound that created that blood spatter against that wall and she says he's attacking me but you can't attack someone when you're laying face down on the floor so how did he get shot in the head i don't know i cannot what? answer that question i don't know i just know i was trying to get away the hole in the top of his head that gunshot wound that always bothered me the blood spatter on the wall coming from that wound. It takes thousands of puzzle pieces to put together a puzzle. I only needed one at that point. 
And that one piece of the puzzle showed me what she was saying wasn't true. Without hard evidence to contradict Sierra's story of self-defense, investigators let her go and tracked down Elise Jones for questioning. She said that she had shown up with Raheem and got a feel that there, there was some tension in the air. She told the police that Raheem had gotten up and gone into the back bedroom with Sierra, that she perceived that perhaps they were about to have an argument. She sends Raheem a text saying, hey, I'm out of here. That text came in at 1026. Less than 30 minutes later, Raheem is dead. That told us at that moment, that last text message, we knew that Raheem hadn't been shot. The timeline that Elise gave us was inconsistent with what Sierra told police. She never heard anybody hit anyone. She never heard anyone say they were getting a gun or getting a knife or anything like that. Yet again, we have another lie coming from Sierra, who's trying to manipulate the situation. Focus their investigation on learning more about Raheem and Sierra's history together. The neighbor had suspected that there had been a domestic between her and Raheem, not because she knew anything about it, but just because of the circumstances that night. Also, Sierra made those allegations um, during her interview that Raheem was violent with her in the past. We weren't able to substantiate any of those allegations. There was fighting going on. Somebody would have been calling the police. There would be some record of that happening on a regular basis. But I have never heard of anything like that while I work there. Digging through records, investigators discover something that once again calls Sierra's account into question. Sierra actually signed over the rights to Angel to Rahim. We had the piece of paper that showed that. She signed all rights over to Rahim so that he could have full custody. Why Sierra did that, I don't know. Detectives circle back to Rahim's mother, Geraldine Grant, for more intel on the status of her son's relationship with Sierra. We had to go to court in January to try to get the final custody. She came because Angel birthday was in November. And that's when she was crying and saying she had lost her job. And the young lady that she was living with um, put her out. And we was like, well, you know, if Sierra leave, we can't get in touch with her. Then the whole case is going to be just avoided. So we needed to keep her close. He wants it government approved. He wants documents to say that he is the father and he has of her so he wanted to appease her during this time so that he can get custody of the baby according to Geraldine in December as Raheem prepared for his upcoming tour Sierra's behavior became increasingly erratic Raheem's mom tells police that uh, Sierra is very jealous and she tells them that she has instructed Raheem to pull out his cell phone whenever she acts up and start recording and i told them that they need to find a cell phone and they said we had a cell phone we have it and then i told them they needed to look in the cell phone because he keeps a cloud and if he was doing anything it was recorded on that cell phone coming up detectives unlock damning evidence sierra's in the background screaming and yelling and then you hear a shot ring out once they got to watch those videos that's when the truth really started to come out. And Raheem Grant's final moments come into grim focus. Y'all see this? This what this bitch did to me? After a month of investigating the shooting death of Raheem Grant, Investigators believe they might have footage of his last moments in their evidence locker that could be coming to Sierra Harp's claim of self-defense. At that point in time, investigators wanted to know, was there any recordings on Raheem Grant's phone? No one knew the passcode. For weeks, the police department could not get into Raheem's cell phone. There are multiple law enforcement tools that will extract what is on a cell phone and put it into a report. Unfortunately, not all cell phones can be broken. As that phone just sat there, 
nobody in the world knew exactly what happened except for Sierra Harp, and she didn't tell anybody. While Tex attempts to unlock Raheem's phone, authorities begin learning more about Sierra Harp. Born on January 1st, 1989, Sierra Harp always struggled to find her place. Sierra was a troubled child. She didn't follow rules well. She would skip school, she would fight people. Some of Sierra's siblings said, I'm my mother. She ran a tight ship, she wanted you to do right. As she entered her teenage years, Sierra continued to rebel. She always kept a knife on her, a little pocket knife. She told me that she had got kicked out of school for stabbing somebody over a boy. She had allegations of impropriety against a high school teacher that were later determined to be unfounded. Claimed that she had been molested by either a relative or a neighbor or something like that. That proved to be unfounded. She would tell me little stories that made me wonder. She was like, well, you know, I couldn't stand my stepfather. I didn't like my sister because her husband, it was always a man, was always, she always wanted these men and they didn't want her. She was pregnant with Raheem's baby. When I ended up exchanging words with Raheem, I said, bro, you just don't understand what you dealing with. You dancing with the devil. She gonna get you hurt if she don't do something to you herself. While details of Sierra's past raise plenty of suspicion, investigators still don't have the necessary evidence to charge her with murder. If someone acted in self-defense, then that person acted lawfully. Even as tragically as it is that someone else is dead, you can't arrest someone who acted in self-defense. Their only hope is Raheem's cell phone. The one thing that's left to remain, though, we'd like to get into Raheem's phone and see if there's any further evidence that we need, but there's a passcode on it. Do you happen to know what that passcode is? And she gave them the passcode to get into the phone. Once they got to watch those videos, that's when the truth really started to come out. Nearly two months after Raheem's death, a clear picture of his last moments finally comes into focus. There were four videos of the murder right there in front of us. The first video started at 1027. Less than a minute after Elise left. Y'all see this? This what this bitch did to me. Look at this knife. Y'all see this right. Y'all see how this That's Sierra Hart did me. And he's showing all of his injuries on his face. And Sierra's in the background screaming and yelling. And then you hear a shot ring out. It hit the bathroom mirror. Another shot breaks free. And Raheem drops the phone. You hear him grunt in pain. And we're assuming that shot hit him in the back. And that's when Sierra comes into the photo because the phone drops on the floor, camera up, and Sierra's standing over the camera, yelling at Raheem, and is just completely losing her mind, screaming at him in pure, unadulterated rage. The video showed that self-defense wasn't really what was on her mind. You have beat you, man. I've tortured me and all of them. I don't give a f what happens to you. He has been shot, uh, but still, he manages to remain calm. He says, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And she seems to suggest that, yes, you are. Also, Sierra had told us that she had been attacked, had been stabbed in her legs. On the video, she's upright. Uh, she doesn't appear to be stabbed. We were able to take still shots from the video itself and compare them to photographs from the hospital, and we could see a clear difference between the two of them. The left leg, pants were completely intact. There was no blood on them. And actually, she had the pant leg pulled up to the point to expose a tattoo on her calf. There was no injury to the tattoo. So you could tell that that wound occurred after the video had been taken. Raheem is doing a lot of talking, asking for a bottle of water, um, asking her to let him go see the baby, and that's when the first video ends. Then they go to the second video. I love you, and you did me wrong. You can't see any injuries, but she's got blood on her face. During this, Raheem is essentially moments where you step back, 
take a deep breath and put everything in your mind into a completely different perspective that no longer is this the normal behavior of a domestic abuse victim. This is manipulative behavior of a murderer. What hit me the hardest is toward the end, he pleads to just be able to give his daughter a hug. I think at this point in time, he knows that he's not making it past this night. He wants to kiss Angel and she says, you can crawl to her mother and she shoots him twice. At that point, you hear him run out in pain. And that's when that video stops. Pick back up to the third video. You actually hear a child's voice in the background say, Daddy, Daddy. You can actually hear Angel calling for her father. And I think that was the final one that really put Sierra over the top. And that six gunshot, you don't hear any more movement. You don't hear any grunts from from Raheem. It was that it was a coup de grace. She stood over him and fired that final round into the top of his head as he laid on the ground. There was no threat. There was no danger there. He was on the ground. He was incapacitated and she still fired. At that point, we were confident that we had a really good murder case. Coming up. To convince a jury, prosecutors must separate fact from fiction. It's not that we don't believe women are victims of domestic abuse. We did not believe this particular woman. They were worried about the narrative that uh, Sierra had spent about him being violent. She just thought she could outsmart the system. February 22nd, 2018, authorities in Clayton County, Georgia, arrest 29-year-old Sierra Harp for the murder of Raheem Grant after discovering video evidence of his horrific murder. I've seen a lot of evil in my career, but I've never seen evil document itself like that. Her second interview is far more interesting. That's when they confront her with the video. When the first gunshot goes off, she covers her face and she just has this, oh my God, look on her face. Despite obvious evidence that what she said happened didn't actually happen. She sticks to her self-defense story until they end the uh, interview. Which I think is possible. Maybe she had told that story enough that she believed it to be true. In May 2019, Sierra's claims of self-defense are tested during her murder trial. Our theory is she pulled the knife that she admitted she always carried and started swinging it around, and that's when he received those superficial wounds to his face. That's when he picked up his phone and went into the bathroom and started video recording and showing everybody that could see the video what she had done to him. I think when she realized that now he was documenting the injury she inflicted upon him and she would have to explain that. That's when she pulled his 380 out and she shot him. Sierra's defense team does their best to combat the video evidence. The defense strategy was twofold. Number one, it was to claim self-defense, that that night that she was acting in self-defense. The other strategy was to combine that with a battered person syndrome. What Georgia law says is you can use self-defense when it's reasonable to, if you believe you need to defend your life upon imminent injury. What's important there is if it's reasonable. That's where a battered woman's defense comes into play because it examines whether or not that belief is reasonable or not. You could argue that maybe her reaction was excessive, but in the context of somebody who's experienced multiple traumas, past abuse, that reaction is justified and needed. Those closest to Raheem and Sierra paint a different picture on the witness stand. Sierra was never crazy. She was always a person that thought out carefully what she did. Everything she did was logical. She was logical in that she stabbed herself afterward to try to make it look like self-defense. She 
Rahim's cell phone and ran with Rahim's cell phone. The four videos, approximately 13 minutes long, mostly show her, and the whole time she is screaming at him about how he has beaten her, all the things that he has done to her. I, I kept thinking, this is a movie, as I'm watching in court, this is a movie, but it was real, it was horrific, it, it was horrible. In her mind, this rant that she goes on in the video is going to further show the investigators how much of a victim she was. She just thought she could outsmart the system. Everybody wanted to say, you know, she... she... Sierra had spent about him being violent, that he had abused her, because she's in this video screaming about, you abused me for four years. It's not that we don't believe women are victims of domestic abuse. We did not believe this particular woman. Maybe she didn't cold-blooded kill him like she just did. So we went to great lengths to make sure that the public knew, hey, your district attorney's office is here to represent you, but we will represent true victims. Sierra Harp was not a victim in this case. Raheem Grant was the victim. On May 22nd, Sierra Harp's cries of self-defense to the jury go unheard. And she is found guilty of six counts of aggravated assault and malice murder. I think the video it provided a backdrop was it would rebut any type of defense that her team would try to put up. A jury would be able to see what a defense lawyer would say might have happened that night. But the jury actually saw when we provided those videos what did happen that night. And that's rare. Raheem deserves a lot of credit. Raheem solved his murder for me. I don't know if justice can ever be served on a case like this. You know, it's not just justice for Raheem, it's justice for Angel. Angel was robbed of her mother and her father in one night. Angel felt a little bit better, but she misses her dad every day and she talks about him every day. And her thing is, I don't know why would she kill my daddy? He was a great daddy. I guess the biggest tragedy is we'll never know. We'll never know fully what we lost. We don't know what kind of career he would have had. We don't know what impact he would have had on Angel. I want Raheem to be remembered as a great son, great father, great person, and let the world know that he was about being there for others, and he loved his daughter.